guys that it's really affecting my voice, so I apologize. I'll probably get a little bit raspier as the evening progresses, and hopefully it'll last. Um, I almost didn't have a voice for the past five days, so for those of you that I've asked to be praying, that I would get it back. Romans chapter 7. I've got to put a little quick plug out here though. As much as I love that we have the Bible available on our phone, I would challenge you guys not to let that be your sole source of reading God's Word. Um, I'm a huge proponent of using the Word of God in this form um, because I challenge students, and if you've spent more than five minutes with me, I may have told you this, um, but I encourage you to have a relationship with your Bible and with the Word of God. Uh, mine's so marked up, sometimes it's harder to read, but I love being able to focus and dig in in that way. So I would just challenge you guys to do that. Have a relationship with your Bible and, and with the Word of God. Don't just use it on your phone, as convenient and easy as that is. Uh, make sure that you're connecting with God's Word this way. It's such a powerful way to connect. But Romans chapter, five, um, chapter 7, sorry. So what are we talking about tonight? Um, in summary, the title tonight is that you are not joined to your sin. Um, we are no longer joined to sin through the law, but joined to Christ through his righteousness. So how does this fit in the big picture? Um, I kind of like the summary I used three weeks ago, so we're going to read through that summary real quick again, and we'll summarize with this week. We are to live by faith because sin demands God's wrathful punishment. That's in Romans 1 and judgment. The law made it very clear that we fail his standards in Romans chapter 2. No one is an exception to this. It is only through faith, Romans 3 and 4, that we can have peace with God. The problem began with Adam and was solved in Jesus, Romans 5. We are no longer slaves to sin, but freed to righteousness, Romans 6. We are no longer joined to sin through the law, but joined to Christ through his righteousness, Romans chapter 7. Pray with me real quick, and then we're going to read our text for the evening. Precious Father, God, I thank you for your faithfulness to us. Um, that out of the magnitude of creation, you call us your special treasure. That out of all the things that you have created, that it is us that you desire to have a relationship with us. Um, that as much as you delight in us, we also break your heart. And Father, I ask that tonight our hearts would be broken um, through Paul's words here in Romans and the message that you have for us. God, I ask that your word would inspire and incite change in us and that we would be primed and ready to receive the truth of your word by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans chapter 7, I'm going to read through this with you and interject some different things that God has shared with me through my study as we go. Um, starting in verse 1, it says, Or do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. So a dead man can't do anything. But for a married woman is bound by the law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Now, quick caveat here. I've actually heard this text used to preach against divorce. And scripture has other things to say about divorce, but that's not what this text is talking about at all. <laughs> So just be careful when you are reading God's word that you read it in context. Um, because what this passage here is talking about is when a woman is currently married, she is bound to that man by law. But when he dies, she is at liberty to marry again. And so it is with us, we are bound by the law to sin. And it's through Christ that we are freed from that, that it is dead, our husband is dead, and we are free to marry again, to marry Christ, to be joined with Christ. That's what this text is talking about here. Then on to verse 4. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What then shall we say that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to cover, covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. 
the very commandment that promised life, proved to death to me. This seems a little bit confusing. What is it talking about? Why is it making it sound like the law is such a bad thing? Um, where are my speed demons in the room? My pedal to the metal people. So you see the speed limit, right? And that limit means that is the thing you are not supposed to go over. It is not saying you have to go at least this speed, correct? Right? But when we see that sign that says speed limit, we're like, speed minimum? <laughs> Right? And so now that we're made aware of what the standard is, what this expectation is, we're like, oh, I have to at least go that far, maybe a little bit further. That's basically what Paul's saying here. The law made us aware of these boundaries, which made us, as sinful man, that much more eager to toe the line. Oh, this is the boundary. This is exactly how close to the ledge I can get. Which a friend of mine mentioned this crazy story. Um, and she was talking about, like, if, if I have a cobra here, and I've actually, in India, saw some. My husband's terrified of snakes more so than me, and he wouldn't let me touch it, even though it didn't have fangs. But the typical person isn't going to see a cobra and go, oh, goody, I want to touch that thing. How close can I get before it's going to bite me and possibly kill me, right? You're supposed to, hopefully, you're like, I'm going to keep my distance. You say no. Where's my snake person here? You want to, like, pet? Okay. Um, so the most normal people are not going to try to like get as close to the danger as possible. But Paul here is saying that because of the law, because of our like firm boundaries of where sin is and what we're not supposed to cross, we tend to find ourselves towing the edge of that line as much as possible. Verse 11, for sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So it is good. But it also sometimes tempts us to, like, toe that line, right? Verse 13, did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandments might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. And this next text gets a little bit confusing with the English language, but here we go. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want. But I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin who dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. And if you're human, chances are you have faced this conundrum. You know what you're supposed to do, you want to do that, and you find yourself continuing to do and be the thing that you desperately so much don't want to do or be. Let's walk through this a little bit. So what about the law? Because it kind of makes it sound like the law is a bad thing here as Paul is talking. What is the law to me now? Is the law sin? No. The law does not equal sin, but it does provoke our sinful nature. It not only reveals sin, but it excites it to action. See, the law shows us where our restrictions are, and these restrictions often cause resentment, and this resentment can often incite rebellion. Sorry. See, the, the law sets for us this impossible standard, right? And I don't know about you guys, but if I fail at something, sometimes I lose my motivation to keep trying. I'm like, well, I already failed at that. What's the point in trying anymore? The law also makes sin exceedingly sinful. That sounds weird. What do you mean by that? Okay, so by contrast, the law shows us what is good, and it, so we are more aware of what is bad, but it also provokes. How many times has someone told you to do something, you're like, okay, I'll do it barely, right? You know, your parents tell you to do something, empty the dishwasher, okay, but I'm not going to put the dishes away, <laughs> right? 
Or maybe you knew your mom would come after you with a wooden spoon, so you went ahead and put the dishes away. My mom was into the wooden spoon, right? Okay. Um, or you have this, this boundary, and you're like, well, okay, but since I can't do that, then, then I can do this. And I know you guys. I've spent a few years with you guys, okay? If, if you guys can find a loophole, you'll point it out to me. Be like, well, you said I couldn't, you know, watch R-rated movies. What about NC-17? You know, like, or, you know, so you show me where these boundaries are. And you're like, well, but you didn't specifically say this, so I can toe this line, right? I can go here. I can do this. One commentator said, the law does not justify us. It does not make us right with God. The law does not sanctify us. It does not take us deeper with God and make us more holy before him. The law is incomplete. And another commentator says, Satan strives to convert an instrument intended for life, the law, into an instrument of death. Satan throughout history has wanted to use the thing that God intended for good, for evil, to twist things. Another commentator said, those who preach only the gospel to sinners at best only heal the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. The law, therefore, is the grand instrument in the hands of a faithful minister to alarm and awaken sinners. And I love that. The law has a useful purpose because it shows us when we fall short. It shows us the areas that we need to improve in our life for God's pleasure. It isn't sin, and it isn't, doesn't make us right with God. No matter how swift or straight the arrow, without a target, there can be no bullseye. It shows us how incomplete we are. So how does the law and sin relate? If the law is not sin, the law is not sin or sinful, but it is three things. It is our teacher. The law is our teacher. It teaches us what we could do, what we should do, but the knowledge wasn't enough. Like a speed limit, knowing and being aware isn't always enough to hold us to the right and proper course. Another commentator said that it's kind of like a man who sits secure in his house in ignorance living on a volcano, thinking that all is well. I'm secure in my house, I'm good, but living at the foot of an active volcano. So the law is our teacher, but it is also our coach. See, the coach, as of the law, encourages us to do what we need to do, but the motivation isn't enough. The knowledge isn't enough, the motivation isn't enough. You know, you want desperately to do the right thing, but you just can't fully arrive there. We often want to do even more the thing that is forbidden. Remember Genesis chapter 3? God had one rule. Don't eat the fruit from this tree. The fruit never looked more delicious. It was never more tempting. That one thing all of a sudden becomes the only thing that we can think about. God says, don't go there. Don't do that. Don't say that. Don't behave that way. Oh, man, it makes it extra hard. My daughter... <laughs> When she sees something she wants, even though I have told her no, it does not stop her from asking, and she is obsessed with that one thing she can't have. My girls may have two bowls, the same color, with the same amount of goldfish, but man, that other person's goldfish looks so much better. No matter how many times I tell them, no, that's not yours, that's your sister's, they keep wanting to go after the thing that is forbidden. We struggle because we're tempted to believe that God wants to deprive us from what is good. I actually had a talk with my best friend earlier about this very thing, that sometimes we're tempted to believe that God wants to withhold the good things from us. So we're just going to do what we want and pray for forgiveness. How close can we get to the edge? How close can I toe the line rather than being motivated to obedience out of love for God? A commentator said, once God draws a boundary for us, we are immediately enticed to cross that boundary which is not the fault of God or his boundary, but the fault of our sinful hearts. It doesn't mean that the boundary is bad or his law is bad or God is bad. It's our sinful nature. The third thing that the law is, it is a doctor. It's a doctor that diagnoses our problems, but the diagnosis wasn't enough. See, the x-ray will show you exactly what the problem is, or the MRI will show you what the problem is, or the blood test will show you what the problem is, but that's not enough because that isn't a solution. It's just a diagnosis. Sin corrupts the work and the effect of the law. Ultimately, as our teacher, our coach, and our doctor, the law was not our savior. We needed Christ because only he can heal, motivate, and instruct us in an internally significant way. I want to show you guys something. A few of you asked why I was carrying these around in my purse. 
this is why. I don't always carry chains in my purse, just on Thursdays. And sometimes Saturday. They're effective, like mace, you know, whatever. <laughs> Come at me, bro. No, okay. Go ahead, have a seat. Come in a second. <laughs> the law is like these chains, okay? Which is kind of interesting. I mean, chains have a purpose. And we talk about different laws in Scripture. Uh, scripture tells us not to commit adultery. And, and Christ even commands us not to lust. You know, it, it tells us not to commit murder, and Christ even tells us not to hate. Scripture tells us not to bear a false witness or lie, or really, honestly, even to stretch the truth. We're not to make a false idol, and this is something that I think we're just like, well, I'm not creating some sort of graven image, and like, I'm not like the Israelites making some golden calf. But how often do you turn to something for your fulfillment or your need or your comfort instead of turning to Christ? You had a hard day. So instead of going to his word or prayer, I turn on Netflix and watch another episode. Or pour another cup of coffee. Not that those things in themselves those are bad, because they're not. I've got my own Netflix shows that I watch and my DVR. But when I go to them before I go to God, they are an idol. And it's another chain. And I fall short yet again. We're not supposed to steal or give in to the temptation for entitlement. But how often do we sometimes toe that line and stretch it a little bit and we take advantage of the generosity of others? Maybe a really understanding boss. We know we're not getting in trouble if we leave work a little early or if we slack off a little bit or we do things more half-hearted because that's stealing too. Scripture tells us to honor our father and mother but, man, my mom can be so annoying. My dad just doesn't understand. And so we still continue to disrespect and dishonor them. Maybe not to their face. Maybe it's just in our heart. But again, we fail the law, and so it shackles us and it holds us. Do you serve sin? Legalism, which I would say is the law. Or do you serve God with newness of the spirit? See, the shift from the law to the spirit is a shift from legalism to true spirituality. Sin can take something that's good and holy, like the law, and twist it to promote evil. It warps sin. It warps love. Sin warps love into lust. And it takes an honest desire to provide, and it warps it into greed. The law, it takes, and it turns it into a promoter of sin. The law is like these chains. But in Romans 7, 15 through 25, it talks about this battle and this struggle. You can go ahead and come up now, dead man. <clears throat> Paul jumps into a discussion about our sinful self. Our sinful self. You're so creepy. I can. I can see you. You're good. You're gloriously hideous. He jumps into this discussion about our sinful self. Okay? And I would say that our sinful self is like a rotting dead corpse. Okay? Because we are dead to Christ. We fail. We are shackled by our sin and our failing of the law. He talks about the carnal man and how there's a thing that we should do, that we want to do, that we can't do. And we are aware of our carnality. And the awareness of our carnality is great, guys. Our sinful nature, the awareness of that is great because it shows that God is at work. But what are you going to do with that? It's a struggle for obedience in our own strength. That's the issue. Legalism always brings a person face to face with their own wretchedness. And if they continue in legalism, they'll react in one of two ways. Either they will deny their wretchedness and become self-righteous Pharisees. I'm good enough, guys. If I put enough makeup on this, I'll be good. You know, you won't see that the flesh is falling off of my face. Or they will despair in their wretchedness and give up following after God. I'm a hopeless case. God can't do anything with this. The problem isn't knowledge. It's power. Because the law gives no power. But there is victory in Jesus. The problem isn't Open your Bibles. We're going to read a couple of scriptures really quick. 2 Corinthians 5.17. But there is victory in Jesus. Open your Bibles. We're going to read a couple of 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. See, this is the unsanctified, unrejuvenated, unredeemed us. This is 
This is sanctified, rejuvenated, redeemed us. But think about it, guys. Going from death to life. That Christ gives life to something that was dead, that was cursed, and that was condemned. Colossians 3, 9 through 10. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And then Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. Again, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created in the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. I want to ask you guys, do you passively, despondently sit waiting to be obedient and be delivered? Because I think sometimes we're so overwhelmed with our sin that we're content to stay here waiting for God to do everything. And I would challenge you guys that instead, we need to race after the deliverance and obedience to pursue Christ and quit camping out here and to follow after him and his word. Your desire must go beyond a vague hope to do better. You must cry out against yourself and cry unto God with the same desperation that Paul did. See, if we're waiting on our own strength, we're going to be stuck right here, metaphorically with this smelly, rotting corpse. Not with the new self, the sanctified, rejuvenated creation that God has made us. Luther says, this is the proof of the spiritual and wise man. He knows that he is carnal and he is displeased with himself. Indeed, he hates himself and praises the law of God, which he recognizes because he is spiritual. But the proof of a foolish, carnal man is this that he regards himself as spiritual and is pleased with himself. If you're content with where you're at spiritually, I'm really worried about you. Because we should never be content to stay exactly where we are. The great saints through the ages do not commonly say, how good am I? Rather, they are apt to bewail their sinfulness. There was something really interesting, and this is what really made the whole passage connect and click for me. Because when Paul was saying in um, the end of chapter 7, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He was talking about a practice that tyrants often had. And the band, you guys can go ahead and come up. We'll be done in just a second. He was talking about a practice that these tyrants often had. And it was a very fearful punishment. Because see, what they would do, they would take a living person and they would chain them to a dead one. Go ahead and hold this one. They would take a live person and they would chain them to a dead one. And I know it seems kind of comical, but I, got, I want you guys to think about that for a moment. You are in prison and you are shackled to they something that is dead. Not just dead weight, but decomposing. It is a stench you cannot get away from. It follows you wherever you go. And any time that you try to move, to take care of your hu basic human needs, you have to drag this corpse along with you. It, follows you wherever you it go. makes it impossible for you to really effectively do anything. And nobody is going to want to be around you when you're connected to a corpse. But guys, when we are a Christian, when we have been bought by the blood of Christ, and we refuse to let go of our sin, and we try to live in our own strength, and our own ability, we're hanging on to these chains of self-righteousness through the law and connecting ourselves to a corpse. And sometimes, we may lose the chains. Sorry. We may lose the chains, but we're still so obsessed. You can look at and admire his scary face for a second. Guys. Sometimes, See, sin can be kind of terrifying, sort of like a train wreck or a car accident, and you slow down a little bit because you want to see exactly how bad it is, okay? You want to see what's going on, you want to see, because you don't really want to see a person on the side of the road, but you also kind of want to see what's going on and what's really there, right? Sometimes we're so disgusted or so curious about sin or about the horror that we're looking at it, but sometimes it's also because we're curious, we're intrigued, why is this this forbidden thing? You know, what is so tempting about being drunk? 
why is pornography so addicting? I'm not going to like totally give in to sin. I'm just going to like tip my toe in the water just a little bit to see what it's like. We're so focused on sin that we miss Christ. How can you become like Jesus when you're not even looking at him? You're looking at your sinful dead self. We're so focused on sin. It is a complete disrespect to the way that God has redeemed us when we are so focused on our sin that we miss the Savior. He's freed us from those chains. We're not stuck here anymore. We can't live in freedom. You want to know why you can't stop going to those websites or saying those words or having those conversations or doing the things that you're not supposed to do even though you don't really want to do it? It's because you're staring at your sin. You're not staring at the cross. You want to move past your sin? You want to stop doing the thing that keeps tempting you? It's because you're staring at your sin. You're not staring at the cross. You want to stop doing that thing? You, want to move past you need to look at Christ. You want to stop doing, the thing that keeps stop doing it in your own strength. Well, Shane, that's an oversimplification. If you you're obsessed with Jesus, thing? instead of obsessed you with your sin, Christ. you're going to experience liberty. Stop you're going to experience freedom. Shane, he has freed you. With Jesus, of you don't have to sin, do it on your own. You don't have to cling to this dead, rotting corpse anymore. He has well, it's familiar. You. It's the thing that I know. You it's this trap that I fall into. Are you willing to actually do something about it instead of despondently sitting here holding that dead corpse and going, oh, woe is me. I can't quit doing this. Then of course not, because you're hugging a corpse. You want to change things, then do something. You keep watching things you shouldn't, delete your Netflix account. You keep having conversations you shouldn't, avoid those individuals. Make real change. You keep watching things you shouldn't. You want to experience freedom from your sin? Then pursue Christ. Get up and leave that and let him do that work within you. Follow his example. We don't have to be chained to our old nature anymore, bound by our old sins and hindered by our past identity. But you cannot be like Jesus when you aren't even looking at him. If you're obsessed with chaining yourself to your sinful self instead, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. If you're obsessed with chaining yourself to your sinful self, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. We can't run this race set before us when we're carrying a corpse. And sin which clings so closely and let Looking us run with endurance to Jesus, the, race that is set before the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You want to hear well done, my good and faithful servant, at the end of your life? Quit carrying corpses. Leave the old man behind. Christ has overcome that. He has liberated you. So walk in that freedom. Walk in that grace. Walk in that forgiveness. Quit holding that against yourself and understand who it is that you are in him as a new creation. Don't be enamored or obsessed with your sin. Be obsessed with Christ. Pray with me. Precious Father, God, I thank you for uh, the work that you did on the cross. God, I thank you that we do not need to be chained to sin anymore. God, I ask that we would be obedient to follow you. That when we see that we are not letting go of our sin, that we can't move past the thing, that we would realize it's because we're doing it in our own strength, not in yours. And it's because we are not motivated to change enough because we can't do it on our own. It is by you and by your grace that we would walk in newness of life, that we would look to you instead. In Jesus' name, amen.